Mr. Chairman, may I say that? Podemos empezar? Yeah. Hello. My name is Ezequiel Reyes Gonzalez. I'm a PhD student in the Language Studies Program at Universidad Autónoma de Baja California. And I have the honor of introducing our distinguished uh, guest speaker today. But before doing so, we'd like to welcome everyone to this very special talk, to those joining us in the Zoom meeting. Uh, who are graduate students enrolled in any of the three graduate programs offered at the School of Languages, Especialidad en Traducción e Interpretación, Maestría en Lenguas Modernas y Doctorado en Ciencias del Lenguaje. We'd also like to welcome the hundreds of undergraduate students, uh, faculty, alumni, as well as the many others in the audience who are following this live stream. So it is my privilege to introduce Professor Noam Chomsky. That though may prove to be a good example of the phrase, easier said than done. The truth is that uh, it is impossible to provide an adequate introduction to pro 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 Professor Chomsky. Uh, but I do wanna say that we are delighted, Professor, and honored to be joined by you, who is, uh, Professor Chomsky is, is known to, to be the father of modern linguistics. He's also a philosopher, a cognitive scientist, and a political activist. He is one of the most cited scholars in modern history, one of the most brilliant linguists of the 20th century, and one of the most influential public intellectuals in the world. He is Laureate Professor of Linguistics at the University of Arizona and Institute Professor uh, Emeritus at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He has written more than 150 books on topics ranging from linguistics to war, politics, uh, and mass media. His latest one being Consequences of Capitalism, Manufacturing, Discontent, and Resistance, co-authored with Marv Waterstone. Professor Chomsky, on behalf of the president of the Universidad Autónoma de Baja California and Dr. Daniel Octavio Valdez Delgadillo, the dean of the School of Languages, uh, Dr. Lázaro Gabriel Márquez Escudero, I'd like to, and of course the faculty, the graduate students present here, and the, and the hundreds of people following this live stream, I'd like to express our most sincere thanks for having accepted our invitation to be here today. It's really an honor to have you here. We'll, we have all been looking forward to this day and are extremely excited. The title of today's talk is Generative Grammar and Language Variation. The talk is being live streamed, so we ask that questions are held until the end. Uh, to the audience here in, on Zoom, I'd like to remind you that there's a chat box uh, here on Zoom, and we will be taking questions. So keep that in mind, and uh, we will ask you to then go ahead and post your questions and comments there. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Professor Chomsky. Professor Chomsky, we are eager to, to hear you. Please take it away, Professor. Thank you very much. Glad to be with you. Sorry it can't be in person. Uh, so we should begin by clarifying the terms. So we're talking about language, we're talking about grammar. Uh, what do we mean by those notions? Uh, well, the fact is that language has been studied intensively, productively for 2,500 years. Uh, but if you look through this whole record, it's very hard to find any clear statement about what language is. You might try, there's almost nothing there. There are proposals by leading figures, but they don't get us very far. Actually, there's one traditional idea that prevailed for several centuries, uh, which I think is at least pointing in the right direction, and I'll come back to it. It's the idea that language is audible thought, happens to be the phrase of William Dwight Whitney, late 19th century American linguist. He was summarizing a rich tradition that goes back to the origins of the scientific revolution in the 
17th century, uh, the tradition. He was pretty much at the end of the tradition. It uh, disappeared shortly after he was working, was swept aside by the structuralist behaviorist uh, movements that predominated in the early part of the 20th century. And the tradition was completely forgotten by mid-century when I was a student, uh, no one had ever heard of it. Uh, actually, it was revived in mid 20th century, but from scratch without any awareness that a rich tradition had proceeded. Uh, that's the origins of generative grammar, uh, which also provided new ways of uh, looking at the questions of language variation. Uh, I'll, it, the tradition is still virtually unknown, unfortunately. I'll fill in some of the blanks as we proceed. Well, let's start from the beginning. Uh, we're concerned with human language. Human language, by definition, is a property of humans. So it's a property of me that I speak English, I don't speak Swahili. That would be a different property. If, I, if I'd been born in Kenya, I'd be speaking Swahili. I'd have a different property. Uh, often uh, language is regarded not as a property of humans, but as a property of societies. In fact, that's almost the universal view in uh, structural linguistics and philosophy of language. So European structuralism uh, adopted the Saussurian view that uh, language is some kind of social contract, an agreement among individuals, basically part of sociology. Uh, American structuralism took pretty much the same view. Uh, the leading figure in American structuralism was Leonard Bloomfield, he put it a little bit differently. He described uh, a language as the sentences that can be used in a speech community. We're talking about a speech community. So it's a property of the community. Well, these moves uh, actually presuppose the properties of individuals constituting the community. So it's not a community of some English speakers and some Swahili speakers. Uh, and it presupposes the individual properties and adds something more, something about the nature of the societies. So the concept is basically sociological, not biological, but it builds on the biological properties of humans, uh, the properties that constitute the human faculty of language somehow coded in the brain. Uh, so that seems to be the right point of departure. Well, there's very strong evidence that language is uh, what's called a species property. That is, it's uh, common to all humans, apart from very severe pathology, and it has no significant analogs anywhere in the animal world. So if uh, you find a child in the Amazon who's in a group that's had no human contact for 20,000 years, uh, bring him to New York, he'll speak with a New York accent, uh, go on to study at Columbia and become a quantum physicist. If you take an infant from New York and put him in the Amazon, he'll be learning all those amazing skills, which maybe some of you have seen, I have, where children with no education or training can somehow find the right trees and pick the right fruit off them and not use the wrong ones and end up very happy and surviving, different kind of intelligence and skills. And of course, their language turns out to be the same, basically looks different, but when you look at it in any depth, it turns out to be essentially the same as the New York dialects, recent discoveries. Uh, so it's a species property. 
and it is unique. There is nothing in the animal world that has any analog to it. Now that does raise questions. It uh, raises questions about the for the study of evolution of language. Uh, it's pretty good reasons. I'll come back to more than pretty good reasons to believe that language emerged along with Homo sapiens. That's about two to three hundred thousand years ago. Uh, we know from genomic evidence that, lang that humans, there were very small scattered groups of humans at the time, that humans began to separate about 150,000 years ago, maybe earlier, but at least 150,000 years ago, that's been established. They have the same language faculty. Uh, so that means the language faculty was there before 150,000 years ago. There's no evidence for any significant meaningful symbolic activity prior to the emergence of humans. The symbolic activities constant, regularly and plausibly taken to be an index of possession of language. Well, if that's all correct, it means language emerged in a very narrow window. Uh, notice that all these times are instants of evolutionary time, flick of an eye. So somewhere in this very narrow window between the emergence of Homo sapiens and the starting of the separation, the language faculty appeared with no analogs elsewhere. Now there are other mysteries. This is one, come back to it. It also poses a problem for trying to understand the the neurology, the neuroscience of language. It's a very live topic, a lot of work, but very hard to do. Uh, we know quite a lot about the neurology of the neural basis for human vision. Uh, the reason is we torture animals, rightly or wrongly. We carry out uh, invasive experiments with cats and monkeys. They have the same visual system. So you can learn quite a lot about the human visual system by sticking electrodes into the visual cortex of kittens or raising monkeys under conditions of blindness and so on. And that carries over to humans. But you can't do that for language because there's no organism that has anything remotely like it. So even if it were considered ethically permissible, you there's nowhere to look, which makes the study of language particularly difficult and particularly interesting. You have to find more clever ways to try to found, find out these things, and a lot has been learned. Well, uh, given just this much, uh, we can see that there are going to be two kinds of theories uh, for language. There will be theories for the individual languages. So a theory of uh, the Amazonian language, I imagine the child in uh, geo theory for the New York dialect of English. Uh, and there will also be a theory of the general faculty of language. It's a much more interesting and deeper question. What is this unique human possession which shows up in one or another form under different uh, external conditions. It's genetically determined. It's the basis for acquisition and uh, use of language. The name for this general theory in the modern period is universal grammar, UG it's called. That's a traditional term which is here adapted into a new context. So you have to be careful about that. It's often misunderstood, even in the professional literature. It's not the same as the traditional theory of looking for regularities in language. That's interesting work, but it's different. There's interesting work on things that generally hold of languages. Uh, so there are very few uh, languages which are of the form object, subject, uh, verb, couple, and very rare. That's an interesting regularity. You want to find an explanation for it. But that's not UG. UG is about the genetical, genetically 
determined base for the faculty that enables you to acquire, use a language, different topic. Uh, well, the genetic basis uh, directs the course of acquisition, but it does it in close interaction with uh, general laws that are independent of language. A lot of laws about just how organisms behave, not particular to the organism in question, and those interact with genetics. That's true of all growth and development. There's another factor, of course, the external environment. Uh, the process of acquisition is set off, uh, triggered in a technical sense by some exposure to language, not very much, it turns out. And uh, it's directed one way or another towards the Amazonian language, Swahili, English, whatever, by something about the external environment. Actually, this turns out to be a much more limited extent than is commonly assumed. Experimental studies of many kinds have established that. I'll come back to it. But these three factors are involved in acquisition of language. UG, the genetic basis for the language faculty, species property, general principles outside of language, the particular uh, environmental conditions in which language developed, which can be very limited. In fact, I might mention that there are even cases that have been discovered of uh, spontaneous development of language with no external input. I could go into this later if you're interested. All that seems to be required is for a couple of young children to be together and language comes up. Uh, it's very it's deeply rooted in the in the nature of the organism. Well, language is a computational system. It deals with what's called a discrete infinity of expressions. It's kind of like the numbers. One, two, three, they go on forever. Uh, there's nothing in between six and seven. That's not a natural number. Uh, same with language. There's a six-word sentence. There's a seven word sentence, there's no six and a half word sentence and they go on forever. Now that's what's technically called discrete infinity. A discrete infinity requires some process that generates the objects that constitute the discrete infinity. So for numbers, it's adding one, keep doing that over and over, you get all of them. It's gotta be something similar for language called a generative process, internal coded in the brain, which tells you how to go on forever. The, uh, uh, we uh, expect, it's, notice that this is not necessary. There are systems that aren't discrete. So take uh, what's called the language of the bees. Um, you all know about that. The bees leave the hive. They, fly around, some of them find the flower, they fly straight back to the hive, which is quite a trick, incidentally. Humans can't do that. It's called the dead reckoning. They somehow, after wandering around, get to the flower, go straight back in a straight line to the hive. Humans can only do that with complicated instruments, but the ants or bees have it built in. Not so simple. They're smarter than we are plenty of ways. The, uh, uh, but the, and when they come back to the hive, they wave their wings around in a certain fashion and the other bees in the hive then go out directly to the flower. They have been informed where the flower is, what quality it is, uh, how high it is and so on. That's a communication system, but it's not discrete infinity. It's what's called continuous. It's, just, it's like the points on a line, not discrete. Uh, so you can have systems that don't involve discrete infinity. They have defects. And one of the defects is what's called error correction. That's why computers use discrete infinity, because you can correct errors quickly. With the continuous system, if there's an error, it just propagates. 
So there's a good reason for using discrete infinity. Mother Nature knew what she was doing. Uh, and that's unique to humans, apparently. So animal language, there are animal languages which are discrete, but they're finite. Like a monkey can have 15 calls or something. Uh, the two dogs under my desk have a finite number of signals that they respond to. I don't want to use them or they'll be racing for the door. But uh, uh, but uh, human language is unique in that it's a system of discrete infinity. So we expect to find, and in fact we do find, that the principle that there are principles of computational efficiency that enter into the acquisition of use of language. And there's very interesting work on that. Well, that's one species property, language. There's another species property, thought. Uh, the capacity for thought, at least in any form intelligible to us, is uh, uniform among all humans, all humans have it, and it's unique to humans. We don't know of anything comparable anywhere in the universe. Uh, the, uh, as far as we know, there's no thinking in the universe apart from Homo sapiens. Uh, not, uh, 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 sorry, I thought somebody's trying to say something. Uh, that means there's been, as far as we know, no thinking in the universe in, except for the last couple hundred thousand years. And if you look at what humans are doing now, they seem to be trying to put it to an end, but that's a separate question. Well, as an aside, uh, there are some very recent studies, last couple of weeks, physics journals, which uh, indicate that it's highly unlikely that the basis for intelligent life could have appeared anywhere in that part of the universe that is accessible to us under the conditions of physical law, bounded by speed of light and so on. Turns out it's extremely unlikely that the what's necessary for complex life could have developed. So we may indeed be alone in the accessible universe in possessing language and thought, and all of this in a fraction of evolutionary time. It's kind of useful to keep this in the background when we think about what we're discussing. Something quite unique and remarkable in the history of the universe. Well, it's very natural to link language and thought, the two essential species properties of humans. And as I mentioned before, the most prominent uh, conception of language for centuries did adopt that stand. And that's the concept of language as audible thought. Side comment, we know that it doesn't have to be audible. It's now understood that any sensory motor modality could, could work, mainly the standard one is sign. So sign language among the blind develops almost exactly the way spoken language does among hearing people with the same um, history, same history of development, same use, same structure. So it seems to be kind of sort of accidental or, you know, that we're using sound rather than sign could be the other, could be touch even, but that's harder. Can't be smell because our capacities are much too limited. If it was my dogs, it could be smell, but we're limited. Um, but it's basically neutral. In fact, you can think of the language as being sort of like your laptop. Your laptop has an internal program in it say a program for calculation, but the laptop doesn't care what printer you use. You can hook it up to any printer you want. Uh, the sensory motor system is kind of like the printer that's attached to the internal program. The really interesting part is the internal program. It's worth, I'll come back to that. Well, uh, this uh, idea was part of a very rich tradition uh, lasted until the late 19th century. As I mentioned, it was eliminated by the structuralist, uh, behavioralist uh, approaches that dominated in the first half of the 20th century. They're still very much around and 
other areas in language too. Well, let's just take a quick look at some of the high points in the tradition. They're quite illuminating. Now, let's start in the 17th century scientific revolution. Uh, Galileo, his contemporaries were rethinking everything about the nature of the physical world. They were asking questions about things that were taken for granted, which is a good attitude to have. They were not satisfied with the standard answers, like uh, if I hold a coffee cup up and it's got boiling water in it, and uh, say I have my, <laughs> you can imagine my hand over it. I take my hand away and I drop it. Uh, the steam will rise to the heavens, the cup will fall to the ground. There was an answer for that. They were moving to their natural place. So the natural place for the coffee cup is on the ground, the natural place for the steam is up there. Uh, Galileo and his contemporaries didn't like that answer or any of the other standard answers that were given. So they wanted to know what's really going on. And they also, and that's the birth of modern science. Uh, something similar happened in the case of language, which I'll come back to. The, uh, in fact, right in the mid 19th century, 20th century, it was assumed that basically the questions are answered. Structural linguistics had procedures for analyzing texts. When I was a student, you learned field methods. Here's the way you go out into the field. You collect the data and you have procedures by which you can find the elements and their arrangement. You write them down, you're finished. We had answers to everything. Uh, the generative grammar actually began by saying, uh, and none of these answers make any sense. You know, language is not a matter of habit and training the way it was is a lot more to language than just the units and the way they're distributed, like answers to questions, uh, like how are we doing what we're doing right now? That's not a matter of just uh, elements in their arrangement. And that beginning to be puzzled about those questions quickly led from a situation where it seemed everything was known to a situation where nothing was known. Everything was a puzzle. And that's the beginning of modern linguistics, kind of similar to the 17th century. Still very far from having been accepted by the field, I should say, just as Galilean physics wasn't accepted for a long time. Uh, it's uh, the, uh, like the aristocrats, the funders in Galileo's time, didn't see any point at all in why he was asking for support for studying a, a ball rolling down a frictionless plane instead of studying something interesting like the growth of flowers or the way leaves blow in the wind or something like that. It's quite a significant transition. Study of language, psychology hasn't really been made yet. It should be made. Uh, well, they were also interested in uh, the language. They were concerned by language and they were struck by what they regarded as a remarkable fact. And I think we should think of it too. Things that look obvious when you look into them are, can often be pretty astonishing. So the fact that this that caused awe and amazement among Galileo and his contemporaries was the fact that with a few dozen symbols, we can somehow construct infinitely many thoughts in our minds. And we can even find a way to convey the inner workings of our mind to other people who have no access to our minds. It's kind of miraculous. How can this possibly happen? Galileo himself thought that the alphabet was the most stupendous invention in all of human history because it was able to carry out this amazing feat greater than the feats of a Michelangelo or Titian. Uh, and uh, sometimes we can call that the Galilean challenge, try to answer this question. Descartes, a few years later, focused on the same property of, of human language, 
as a basis for establishing the second substance, mind as distinct from body. He called it race cogitans, thinking subject, substance, linking thought and language almost reflexively and quite rightly. Well, when uh, uh, these ideas uh, led to very important work in what was called universal and rational grammar. Uh, universal because they wanted to cover everything, uh, rational because they wanted explanations, not just taxonomy. Uh, that's uh, the tradition. Uh, but despite some achievements, the efforts foundered. Uh, they didn't have the right concepts. They didn't have the tools to express the fact that a finite number of symbols or a finite object like the brain can somehow deal with an infinite number of objects. Well, that uh, lack was overcome in the 20th century with the development uh, of the modern theory of communication. Alan Turing, Kurt Gödel, other great mathematicians uh, developed what is now the modern theory of computation, which did provide the right tools. It meant that you can address the Galilean challenge, at least in part, we know what it means to generate an infinite number of uh, expressions in the mind from a finite num number of symbols, uh, a finite brain. Same with your laptop, infinite output in principle if you add memory and finite structure. Uh, notice that this still does not deal with part of the Galilean challenge, question of language use. It's the part of, it's the part that concern Descartes. How can we constantly be producing new thoughts and new sentences, capturing those thoughts, uh, use them in a way which is novel, never happened before, others understand it, it's appropriate to situations, it's not caused by the situations. It's a fundamental problem uh, for which we have no answer. Uh, it's part of a much more general problem for which there's no answer. Uh, the question of how you do something simple, like say, raising your finger, well, that's studied. This creative aspect of language is much too complicated to study, but there is study of how you do this and there are no answers. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the leading specialists on the topic, the leading neuroscientists, uh, actually two scientists at MIT, Emilio Bizzi and Robert Ajemian have a recent article surveying the state of the art in which they say, we've learned a lot about voluntary motion, but there's a problem. Uh, they put it sort of fancifully. They say, uh, we're beginning to understand the puppet and the strings, but we don't have anything to say about the puppeteer. Um, how does all this, what makes it happen? That's a total mystery, no, nothing to say about the neural basis of that or how it takes place. Uh, well, that's where we stand. Anyway, a generative grammar is the theory of the particular language. It determines the structure of infinitely many expressions of thought. It uh, specifies how they're externalized in some sensory motor system UG's the theory of the faculty of language itself. Well, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, language, the system is, enters into perception, enters into production. Uh, it's a lot to say about perception, more specifically, what's called parsing. So if you've taken a course in psychology of language, you learn about parsing. Uh, that's a part of perception not all of it. There's more to perception. Uh, perception involves all the background understanding that provides a certain interpretation to what you parse, but that's too complicated to study. So what's studied is parsing, which is in fact kind of a reflex. It uses the principles of language and perceptual strategies in a deterministic way to go from a 
sound or something on paper to uh, parsing of the sentence, sending out its structure, the basis for semantic interpretation. Uh, since it's a reflex, you know how to study it. It's an input-output system. Production, you can only very partially study because you run into this serious block about the puppeteer. Can't do anything about that. Uh, but the internal language, with the knowledge that you possess, that you can study. That's like studying the programs in your computer. You can study that. It's a different kind of program, but you can do it. Well, that's pretty much the general terrain. If you're going to be looking for a job in linguistics, uh, the jobs are where the money is, of course. The money's in Silicon Valley. Uh, Silicon Valley, they're not interested in any of these things. They're interested in the natural language processing, which is a low level engineering occupation. Useful, well, a lot of engineering. It's nice to have a snowplow clear the street instead of doing it with a shovel, but it's not a contribution to science. Uh, the stuff that makes the newspaper headlines, all the excitement about what machines can do, that's brute force engineering. Tells you nothing about language, nothing about psychology. It's worth keeping that in mind. Uh, but that's where the jobs are, so you may end up there. Uh, again, perfect. nothing wrong with it. It's, I use the Google Translator. It's useful. But we have to distinguish that from study of uh, science in which you're trying to find, gain some understanding of the way the world actually works. Well, uh, there are by now partial generative grammars for a very wide range of languages of the broadest typological variety. And there is increasing understanding of the uh, innate endowment, the interaction with general principles of computational efficiency that directs the acquisition of language. Uh, there isn't time for extensive illustration, but let me just give you a couple of cases to just illustrate the flavor of the problems that arise when you begin to be puzzled about these questions and look into them. So take the sentence, uh, the shooting of the hunters is a crime. Okay. Well, first of all, it's ambiguous. Uh, the hunters could be doing the shooting. Uh, they can be shot. So you have to deal with that somehow. The internal program in your brain is somehow determining that. But there's also something very puzzling about it, which was never really noticed until recently. That has to do with the inflection of the copula. So why did I say the shootings of the hunters is a crime? Why not the shooting of the hunters are a crime? Well, if you think about it the way agreement works in natural language. The verb gets its inflection from the nearest noun phrase. Well, the nearest noun phrase here is hunters. So why isn't it the shooting of the hunters are a crime? Now, that's a question like, why does the coffee cup fall to the ground and the steam rise to the air? Sort of obvious. What else could it be? But it isn't obvious. In fact, it seems contrary to the general principle that and so-called um, you know, agreement looks for the nearest element, which it does, in fact. Uh, now, sometimes it can uh, go back to the farther elements. So if I say, for example, the, the many conquests of Rome were crimes, were, not was, crimes, even though Rome is the nearest element. So we have a puzzle. They're both ambiguous in the same way. In one case, agreement goes to the closest element, in one case it goes to the most remote element. That is, in fact, highly puzzling. When you look into it, it turns out to be a consequence, an illustration of a very deep universal property of language, one that has many consequences in all languages. Uh, the rules that yield thoughts, the basic internal part of language, doesn't pay any attention to linear order, it doesn't even know it's there. It relies only on abstract structures. 
It's a principle called structure dependence. So what the, the verb, the copula is just asking, what is the structure of the sentence? Structure of the sentence happens to have a complex noun phrase. And it's looking at the structure of that noun phrase. You don't hear that, you hear a sequence of words, but the mind constructs the shooting of the hunters as a unit, has an internal structure that the mind constructs and works through all of that, finds out what to agree with. The child doesn't hear it. The child hears a sequence of words, uh, but it only works on this abstract structure, it ignores the sequence of words. It's a pretty astonishing fact. It means that uh, it's also known incidentally by experiment now that uh, children know all of this as early as you can test. By now, two years old or less, you can begin to sort of test knowledge. They don't exhibit it, but you can test it. Turns out as early as you can test, children know all of this, know exactly how it works. Uh, very little evidence. They've had very little evidence, almost nothing, nothing relevant to this. Well, that means that by virtue of its mental design, universal grammar, the child, the infant is ignoring 100% of what it hears out the linear sequence of words. It's paying attention only to what it never hears, the abstract structures created by the mind. On the face of it, that's a pretty puzzling phenomenon. Actually, experimental studies have shown that this is true across the board. Uh, take word meaning, the meaning of the simplest words, uh, dog, uh, river, and tree, any word you like. When you look at them carefully, these words have quite intricate meanings. And it turns out that they're learned with almost no experience, one or two presentations and they're learned in their full richness. At the peak period of language acquisition, about two to three years old, a child is learning a, a word every waking hour, meaning with almost no experience, and they're learning it with all their richness. Now that, and they even learn some pretty abstract ideas very quickly. Now the main researcher on this is Lila Gleitman, old friend. Uh, She's pointed out that one of her favorite examples, which very young children know, is the sentence, that's not fair. Every kid understands that. Try to take it apart. It's an extremely complex notion. The philosophers write whole books about it, trying to figure out what it is. Jack Rawls's book on theory of justice, for example. Well, every infant knows what it means with no experience. All of these things are pretty puzzling when you think about them. Well, take this, uh, all of this incidentally is quite in contradiction to what's very commonly assumed. It's usually assumed that language is taught, trained, long period, you have to have a lot of experience, conditioning and so on. Oh, totally false. Nothing like that happens. Happens almost instantaneously, bare, experience, in some cases, literally no experience, but uh, just the way our minds are built, just the way the bees can do all this complicated business about finding flowers. We're just built that way. Uh, incidentally, that's, uh, so how does it work? Well, it turns out that this universal property of structure dependence, which you find all over the place, uh, it of course cannot be learned, but it, uh, it does follow from the simplest computational operation. If you look into the nature of computation, the very simplest computational operation happens to yield this property. Now that tells you something. Uh, it tells you that in the course of evolution, when human beings came along, some small rewiring of the brain took place, maybe some very small mutation, and it provided the concept of a uh, generative procedure, recursive procedure, like adding one. And then Mother Nature picked the simplest way of doing it. 
found the simplest procedure, stuck that in our heads. You get the principle of structure dependence and all of the consequences. Actually, that's the way evolution works. It's not taught that way mostly, but the innovative steps in evolution, like a mutation or a number of others, they lead to some small change. And then the laws of nature enter and you get a particular outcome, which is designed to be perfect, the simplest possible outcome. That's just the way nature works. It may not be useful, may be dysfunctional, in fact. Now that shows up later. Natural selection, if there's a range of possibilities, it'll throw out the worst ones. But the innovative steps come just basically by laws of nature and by accident. Like uh, one bacterium swallowed another one, you get complex cells. Uh, some minor change in maybe one alley, um, you sort of suddenly get a different phenomena. Uh, so language is, falls into place in the natural order of things with very strange properties, like the ones I've just mentioned. Uh, one of the many consequences of this is that language has two components. I've already alluded to them. There's an internal one that generates thoughts and it keeps to abstract structures, ignoring everything you hear, ignoring linear order, most elementary properties. That's one part of language. Now, the other part is a component that takes what this internal system is generating and externalizes it to some sensory motor system. That's the internal program on your laptop and the printer outside, which the internal program doesn't care about. Well, strictly speaking, externalization to sound is not part of language. Rather, it's a, an amalgam of language and some sensory motor system that has no relation to language. Uh, the auditory and articulatory system or gesture system were around millions of years before the language ever appeared. Yeah. And they haven't changed at all since the last couple hundred thousand years when they've been used for externalization. So they're just something totally separate from language. The externalization procedure is actually solving a hard cognitive problem. It's important. How do we take two systems that have nothing to do with each other and relate them, the internal program and the printer. How do you do that? Turns out there's a lot of different ways of doing that. That's the variation of languages. The variation of languages seems to fall almost entirely in the externalization process. Maybe, in, if we knew enough, maybe entirely. Could be that the internal system which generates thoughts is just uniform among humans. We can't prove that now, but research is tending in that direction. And it makes some sense because the internal system is unlearnable. There's no way to learn structure dependence. It's inconceivable. There's no way to learn the basic meaning of words. You can learn little bits and pieces about the periphery like you can learn what sound to attach to them. So if you're speaking English, you say tree. If you're speaking German, you say Baum. That's the same concept with all of its richness and complexity. And in general, what learning, what we call learning seems to do is sort of tweak the periphery, just the surface. But what's going on internally seems to be uniform. So going back to variety of languages, seems to be just a superficial phenomenon that doesn't really mean a lot. It's, uh, it's the kind of topic that we've always studied for thousands of years, because it's what you see, but in a way it's the wrong topic. The right topic is the internal system that you don't see. It's internal to the mind. It's kind of studying the real laws of motion, but not the way leaves blow in the tree. That, it's not, in, not interesting. You're not going to find much about that. It doesn't mean the topic's uninteresting. It's important. There's a lot to say about it, quite a lot. Uh, very rich topic, but it's not language proper.
language proper is the internal system that generates thoughts could turn out, can't say it yet, but it could turn out that it is literally uniform among humans. It's only tweaked around the periphery. Well, also turns out that uh, the system that Mother Nature produced is sometimes dysfunctional. Uh, in fact, I've just given an example with a copula, which can be tricky, can even yield to cases where you just can't say what you're thinking. So take something simple like uh, disjunction or Bill or Tom. Uh, you can say Tom or Mary uh, were in the room. Uh, you can say the men and the girls were in the room, but uh, try doing it with or. You can say John or Mary is is here. You can say the men or the girls are here. Try saying the men or Mary can't be is, can't be are, can't say it. There's no way to express that. The reason, again, has to do with structure dependence. You have to have a uniform property of the noun phrase for the verb to agree with. So there's a thought you just can't express. I mean, you can, of course, express it in a slightly more complicated way, thoughts there. But Mother Nature happened to define and design a system which gives you cases where you can't say anything. A uh, number of such, many such cases. There's also cases where the way the simplest system operates, make, imposes difficulties on the problems of parsing, perception, and production. But that's the way evolution works. Evolution does not aim to give you something that works well. It aims to give you something that's well-designed. We all know that from our own lives. Uh, almost everybody has back problems. And the reason is the spine is very badly designed. Uh, in fact, all big mammals have back problems. The cows don't know how to complain about it. We do, but uh, uh, just because any engineer could design a better system than the spine. But it happened to evolve finding the perfect solution to each problem that came along, ended up with something extremely dysfunctional. Uh, there are a lot of illusions about evolution and one should dismiss. So the fact that language was designed to be perfect, basically, but not always functional is not a, not a design, not a problem. Well, uh, the, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, that's, um, I think I'm probably running when I stop at this point. There are many examples like this. So I'll just leave it here. Yeah. Actually, oh, so you may go ahead. One you may final, go ahead. One final comment. We're actually getting to the point for the first time ever, the last 10 or 15 years, where a lot of these problems are answerable. They're not just puzzles. That opens very interesting prospects for what lies ahead, but I'll stop there. All right, Professor, uh, we have to say that we are really, really uh, excited again over this uh, amazing talk. Thank you for sharing with us all of that you have shared. And uh, you have said really some um, phrases, some things that we have we had never heard before. And it really uh, changes our perception of, of, of language. Professor, um, here we have a mixture of graduate students. Some of them belong to uh, the translation area. Some of them belong to the teaching area. And, um, and I'm sure they have uh, questions that they would like to ask. Um, we're going to be reading some questions that uh, they have previously submitted. And uh, hopefully you can help us um, answer these questions. And uh, because, it's um, it's very interesting. All of what you have said is very interesting. Now, we have the first question here. A question here, Professor Chomsky. Uh, according to famous quote by you, language is a process of free creation. 
but the manner in which the principles of generation are used is free and infinitely varied. But how do you think languages should be taught in the present? What should be the main focus or the top priorities? Well, there's a general point about teaching, which all of you who are teachers know very well. Uh, about 95%, maybe 99% of the success in teaching is motivation. If uh, the student isn't interested and doesn't want to learn, sees no point, they can study for the exam, get an A, and two weeks later, forget what the course was about. I'm sure you've all had that experience. I have. Uh, if the students, so the worst possible way to teach is the way that's the norm in the United States, instituted under the Obama administration, recent administrations called teaching to te test. You have to teach people to pass standardized tests. Absolutely worst way to teach, you know. We all, um, it's a guaranteed you'll never learn anything, okay. That's, uh, this used to be ridiculed during the Enlightenment when they talked about these things as a model of learning, which is like pouring water into a vessel and then gets poured out again. So not that way. Uh, what, the, what teaching has to be done is to be designed so that the student wants to pursue it, that there are questions they're worth learning something about. Uh, there's a reason to do this. I mean, the motivation could be, I want to talk to my grandmother. That's motivation. Uh, the motivation could be, look, this is an interesting problem. I want to solve it. But it's got to be something that catches the student's interest. Uh, once you've reached that point, it doesn't really matter a lot what method you use. You've already made it. From then on, it's just basically immersion. Uh, here's the materials. Figure it out. You know, I should say the... When I was a grad student, I'm a student myself, I was taking graduate math courses. One of the best courses I ever took was by a very good mathematician who used to come into the room and look at the blackboard and look puzzled and write something down on the blackboard and turn to the class and say, is that a theorem based on the readings you've supposedly done? And the rest of the class was interaction, trying to figure out if that's a theorem or not. Uh, you learn something that way, doesn't, you, maybe you don't, it's not enough to pass the test, you have to remember some other things too, but you've already made it. Now that can be done from kindergarten on, uh, and it is done, but that's the way to teach language. First, make sure the students want to learn something interesting and important for them, then some kind of immersion, of course you have to have materials can't learn uh, Swahili if you given not given, given materials in Italian. So yes, you have to get over that. But that's pretty much it. I don't think there, I've taught children myself language and that's basically what it amounts to. I don't really think there are methods of any kind. And this holds for teaching anything. If the kid's not interested, it doesn't matter what methods you use. If they are interested, practically any method will work. Thank you, Professor, for your kind answer. I have another question here for you. How, uh, where, where do you see the future of linguistics going? Well, that depends on people like you. Linguistics will go where young people carry it. That's the way it works. There are various directions. Uh, one direction is to Silicon Valley uh, to work on the engineering programs of uh, getting a program to work a little more effectively for machine translation, for parsing, for uh, doing things like, I mean, if you have a computer, you probably are text program fills in words for you. It's kind of annoying most of the time, but you're writing something and something comes out and sometimes it's what you want, sometimes it isn't. Now you can work on those things and make them work a little better. That's the stuff that makes the newspaper headlines. 
you get articles in the journals about how we now have computers that can write articles. Yeah, they, by brute force, they can find some regularities and put things together. So it's good for business, sites, journalists, but it's not science. I mean, uh, another direction in which things could go is uh, what I was just talking about, trying to find the answers to the kinds of questions that Galileo and his successors asked. Why is it working like this? What are the principles that lie behind all of these complicated things? Uh, how can it be that we produce infinitely many sentences? Uh, what are the principles that determine what these sentences mean and so on? That's very hard. Try to show that what must be true is true, namely that it's fundamentally the same for all languages. We know that it must be true because otherwise nobody could learn any language. You couldn't learn a language unless most of it's already built in. And since we're all the same, it's going to come out the same. Uh, it's got to be true, but try to show it. Not so simple. Uh, another direction things can go is just as many there is save endangered languages. Languages are disappearing all over the place. That's an irreparable loss. Try to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, revive languages that are disappearing. Now, that can be done. It's being done very effectively. That's a big contribution, not just for linguists, but for the culture and the people. It revives the communities, revitalizes them, rebuilds the culture, rebuilds their integrity. That's something you can do. In fact, there are endless things you can do. Uh, which way it'll go depends on what interests people. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your answer. You said things that uh, really motivate us too. Professor, another question, uh, and then you tell me, you let me know when you think uh, it's, it's, it's enough. How do political interests and social move, movements influence language variation? Oh, quite a lot. Uh, we tend to think these days of nation states as being kind of graven in stone. What else could there be? Actually, the nation state is a very recent development, very recent. In fact, it's still developing in many places. Uh, so take, and that connects with language with this question very closely. So take a country like Italy, for example. We think of Italy as a nation state. And go to Italy, you find lots of people who can't talk to their grandmothers because their grandmothers speak a totally different language. It's incomprehensible. We call it a dialect, but it doesn't mean anything. It's mutually incomprehensible as much as uh, English and Portuguese. My wife's Brazilian. When she talks in Portuguese, it's just noise to me. But uh, and in a way, they're both dialects of Indo-European. But uh, in Italy, there are lots of languages which are disappearing. It's not just indigenous languages. And they're disappearing because the nation state is being formed. It's still in the process of formation. And that's happening for power reasons. Certain part of Italy gained power over the others, imposed its power. They run the television stations, they run the newspapers, the educational system. So their language is becoming the national language. It's in the process of happening right now. And that's happening all over Europe. And you go back a century, the same was true in France. Actually, I had a student, graduate student, got his PhD working on German. He wanted to go to Germany to continue his work. So he managed to get a job in Cologne, Germany. His job was teaching German to German students because their local dialect was so different from German that they'd never be able to get a job. So he had to teach them German. Well, if you go there today, you don't have to do that anymore. They all speak standard German. In fact, they speak English. But uh, all of that is uh, simply the matter of way power systems work. It's imposed. It's in the process of imposing nation states, national languages, sometimes international languages, 
So there's a very close connection between uh, how political power influences language variation. In fact, it tends to destroy language variation very quickly. Uh, on the other hand, social movements are sometimes increasing language variation, like the revival of endangered languages. I'll give you one example from where I spent most of my life, Eastern Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, Eastern Massachusetts is the territory of the mostly the Wampanoag Indians who were exterminated by the settlers, like all of the country, huge process of genocide. Uh, there's still a few remnants, often Cape Cod somewhere. Uh, the language hadn't been spoken for a century. There were no speakers. But uh, one of my colleagues is one of the great modern linguists, Ken Hale, died recently, unfortunately, but a great linguist. Uh, he, uh, he found some woman from the Wampanoag tribe, Jessie Little, though her name, she came in, became a student at MIT under his tutelage. Uh, two of them started to work on the remnants of the language. There were missionary texts and they have comparative evidence and they were able to reconstruct the language. The language now has its first native speaker in a hundred years, Jesse's, Jesse Little Doe's daughter, now seven or eight years old. She revitalized the whole tribe. Everybody's learning the language, culture revived. They're pursuing their land rights for the first time. Lots of things are happening. New society developed, the rich society, uh, new language. Well, that can be done too. It's happening in a number of places. So going back to the question, social movements can affect language variation. They can preserve and develop languages and the cultures and the societies that speak them. It's not just a language. It's cultural wealth, richness of historical tradition of thought of understanding and so on. Lots of things get lost if a language disappears. Thank you, Professor. As I mentioned to you before, we have students here of the three graduate programs that the School of Languages offer. So we have a question here from a translator. Professor, from your perspective, what would you say is the importance of metaphors in communication and language learning? Let's see, I, better if I see it. Is it, oh, what's the importance of metaphors? Well, we're using them all the time. Almost everything we say involves some metaphoric use, uh, even just take the term language. I mean, uh, and for, the, for a, a scientist, let's say a pure scientist, a language is just this thing coded in your head, but we certainly use language way beyond that. Um, when we talk about what you and I are now doing now as language, but that's basically metaphoric. That's uh, extending the concept of the internal notion, the scientific concept to a wider range. When we talk about the language of the bees, it's even more metaphoric. Talk about the language of the stars, even more metaphoric. And that's true of just about everything. Um, we're constantly using metaphors, idioms, uh, all of them extensions of the core literal content of language, uh, just about almost everything you say. Uh, these idioms and metaphors are very interesting. You can't make them up in any possible way. You can make them up only in very limited ways. So for example, if I tell you uh, about somebody I know that he spilled the beans on our what, what we did yesterday, uh, you understand that means he, I couldn't say he cooked the asparagus on what we did yesterday. That doesn't mean anything. You can say he spilled the beans because you can make up in your mind some complicated story about beans falling out of a thing like, okay, that's pretty creative, but it's, uh, if you think what's involved in it, the children learn it very fast. They have all of this, uh, but that's, you know, those are the kinds of metaphors we live with, just about in almost everything.
So they're all, all over the place as soon as you start to look. And one very interesting question, which hasn't been investigated, is why certain things are idioms and others aren't. So why is spill the beans an idiom and eat the asparagus isn't? If you begin to think about it, it's not simple. I mean, here you can sort of figure it out, but if you start looking at the range of these things, it tells you a lot about human creativity and the way uh, the ordinary fundamental creativity that everybody has inside them. It's a way of learning a lot about human intelligence and capacity. It's never been studied. So it's an interesting open topic. For, in fact, almost everywhere you look, there are very interesting topics that nobody's ever thought of studying because people don't get puzzled easily enough. It's when you are willing to be puzzled about something that looks obvious that you begin to get somewhere. I mean, that's true in uh, uh, political affairs as well. I just happened to come off a long interview with a leading uh, uh, specialist on international affairs. And he raised the question with me, uh, what do I think about the threat of China? So I said, what's the threat of China? Well, begin to think about there's no threat of China. And in fact, but you have to think about it. And in fact, there's a very good rule of thumb that says if everybody agrees about something and it has any complexity at all, that ought to set off a light bulb in your head. Something's going wrong. People can't agree about things that are complicated. So you must be being subjected to uh, an indoctrination system. So think about it. That's very much like the cup of coffee falling to the ground. What else is it going to do? You think about it, not so simple. Right. Get into studying, developing modern physics. You ask what the threat of China is. You begin to learn something about how the world works. Okay. If you just accept everything that everybody says, you're basically a robot. If you want to be an independent human being, you ought to be questioning things all over the place, just the way a child does, like a two-year-old, three-year-old kid is asking why all the time, because they want to understand. Well, that gets knocked out of our heads by school, by regimentation, but it's worth recovering uh, in every domain. Uh, so uh, um, uh, this questions like metaphor are a good example. Why are certain things metaphors and idioms, but not others? Turns out to be pretty interesting when you look into it. Thank you, Professor. It is very interesting. And I think you're giving some ideas here to these young researchers. Professor, uh, another question, and, and then we might ask you one more, and that'll be it probably because we don't want to uh, take too much of your time. Yeah. Um, how would you explain the mix of two language structures by bilingual speakers? For example, in Spanglish, that is a mix of English and Spanish, something you could probably be exposed to now in Arizona. Is it here somewhere? In Arizona, people speak uh, sometimes Spanglish, which is a mixture of, of um, English. English and Spanish. Mm -hmm. Spanglish. Spanglish, it's called. Spanglish. Yeah. Yes, sir. What do you think? How would you explain that? What would you say about it? Actually, we all do it. Nobody grows up in a uniform linguistic environment, strictly uniform. We think we do, but we really don't. Like, take me. Uh, my parents were first generation immigrants. Uh, they were both fluent in English, uh, but uh, their native language was Yiddish. Uh, my father, who came to the United States when he was about 17, had a, spoke English fluently, but he had a obvious Yiddish accent. My mother came when she was one. The language of her family was Yiddish, but she just picked up English in the streets of New York. So she spoke with a New York accent. My father spoke with a Yiddish accent. My relatives 
spoke with other accents. The kids I played with in the streets spoke with a Northeast Philadelphia accent. Those are different. Those are all different languages. They're not that different, so they can intercommunicate with one another. But my own language is some amalgam of that. You know, I don't speak the way my parents did. Almost nobody does. You usually speak the way your peers do. Nobody knows exactly why, but that's. I had much more contact with my parents than the kids on the block, but I speak the way they spoke. Somehow children pick up the language of their peers. Now, they also keep all these other languages. Sometimes those languages are very different. Like it could be that your parents speak Spanish or monolingual piece, speakers of Spanish, uh, kids on the street are speaking English. You pick them up, you speak them both natively in normal circumstances. Now, there are many parts of the world where kids grow up speaking four or five languages. West Africa, for example. You talk to your mother this way, you talk to your father a different way, they come from different tribes. You talk to your grandmother some other way, you talk to the kids in the street another way, uh, talk to adults some other way. In fact, kids often don't even notice that they're speaking different languages until a certain age, maybe four or five, you suddenly realize, hey, these are different languages. It's just different ways of speaking to people. I mean, I've seen very funny examples of this, like a friend of mine whose parent who grew up in a Yiddish speaking environment, but spoke English because that's what the kids in the street did. And when he went to school, first time he was in school, the teacher called him up to the desk and he spoke to the teacher in Yiddish because that's the way you talk to adults, you know, and uh, that's the way it is. The children don't even, you can, we don't know how many languages a child can learn, but at least four or five without any problem. And they're, they're just, and they're, they're, you're perfectly native in all of them. Um, the language faculty, whatever it is, is highly productive. Thank you, Professor. Uh, lastly, we have a question here that comes from the people who are following this uh, on YouTube. It says, Professor Chomsky, what are your thoughts on gender neutral pronouns for individuals and inclusive language? Depends how people feel about it. There's no right or wrong. Um, there was a time when, uh, not many years ago, I grew up and th throughout all my life, when the normal way of referring to Afro-Americans was Negro. Now you can't even say the word. They can't even refer to the fact that people once used it. Okay, uh, I'm Jewish. I don't like it if people, you'd call me kike, let's say. Oh, okay, that's me. Uh, uh, there are people who don't think we should use he as the neutral pro pronoun. Okay, so let's use something else. Uh, people's sensibilities, should be taken into account. There's nothing general to say about it. If uh, Afro-Americans don't want to be called by what's now called the N-word, you're not allowed to say it, fine, let's call them something else. Uh, take Native Americans. Uh, should they be called Indians? Well, actually in Latin America, that's acceptable. If you're an Amazonian Indian, called an Indian, you don't see anything wrong with it. Uh, American Indians don't like that. A lot of them. Okay, so you accommodate people's sensibilities. There's no right or wrong about it. Thank you, Professor Chomsky. Professor, um, we have been just, uh, we have enjoyed this uh, talk, we have really enjoyed that. And you can see, I think you can see our faces here on Zoom. And uh, we are really thankful, really happy that you have decided to spend some time with us. And, um, and again, on behalf of the student community uh, at the School of Languages here in Mexicali, Baja California. And uh, again, on behalf of the president of Baba University, on behalf of our dean in the school, at the School of Languages, um, we would like to say thank you 
because you have decided to spend some time with us, share a little bit of your vast knowledge on language, share with us uh, just a, a little of what you know. We feel very thankful, we feel honored. And um, there are some questions that uh, were asked that we don't have time to deal with them. You don't have um, to, to answer because we won't have to take too much of your time. But um, then you mentioned something about um, things that you uh, mentioned that are very interesting and that we probably, I don't know, that could be probably a good excuse to, to I don't know, hold a, another conference in the, in the future, probably, probably not uh, soon. It'll depend on your schedule. But uh, again, you, you leave some things that are very interesting. And again, that could be a, a good uh, excuse uh, for us to meet together again. Professor Chomsky. Hope so. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Sorry, I have to leave. To the, mm -hmm. It's okay, Professor. So we just have to say uh, goodbye to the people who are following this uh, live stream. Uh, we hope you have enjoyed. We hope you have enjoyed this live stream. And uh, you, I hope you have enjoyed the opportunity to listen to Professor Noam Chomsky. Thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Por la conciencia, eh, por la, tenemos aquí ahora en español para nuestros eh, visores. Podemos despedirnos. Gracias por habernos acompañado. A nombre de la Universidad Autónoma de Baja California, la eh, Facultad de, de